Hey everyone and welcome back to another playthrough of Tokyo After School Summoner's main story. We will now be looking through chapter 12. In the previous chapter, which you should of course see as well as all previous chapters, we saw the conclusion of the Warmongers arc. Fire Bertro attempted to reset the loop by causing the moon to collide with Tokyo. Or at least that was his plan before we interrupted that. As it stands now, they have made a tactical retreat and we don't know what is going on with the warmongers. Now we will see what is going on with the invaders. Let us proceed. We will now begin with the very first part. After Division, Beyond Revolution, Part 1, No Battle. I shall provide the third attack you need. Let us do this, now! I command my third eye to open. Let my chakra flow! Ha Achieva's cry, the third eye on his forehead slowly opens, blinking sleepily. Until the power of the rule that commands the cycle of destruction begins to race through Shiva's body. Whoa, what the heck is that stuff? My third eye possesses a rule that allows it to carry destruction to the far reaches of the universe. I am sure even Mahakala, the void, is not exempt from this. Now that his third eye is open, Shiva's chakras begin to awaken. From Muladhara the first to Sahasrara the seventh. Then his understanding goes beyond the seventh chakra, ascending to comprehension of all of the eight consciousnesses, the Alaya Vijnana. It is said that when an individual possesses knowledge of all eight, they will comprehend the meaning behind the cycles of the universe. Don't you see? You are inside the exception, Arathen. This is all that remains of Mahakala, protector of the memories of those who have lost their physical bodies. That mechanical boy, Bertro, I think his name is, he received one of the memories I relinquished. Abruptly, Mr. Mononobe extends his hand toward you, in it is some sort of mechanical box that looks very high-tech. He wanted this to be his final show of gratitude to you for granting his heart's desire. Though lying prone on the ground and quite the worse for wear, Bertrand grins up at the sky. So beautiful. The sky is sparkling in so many colors. Like someone crumbled a rainbow among the stars. <laughs> is that you, Duo? I can't move a single gear. At these words, Duo notices a small cavity in Bertro's chest. Wait, what happened to your CMSU? I gave it to someone. Just a little thank you gift. I thought it might just be the one thing he wanted most in the world. It's only natural to want to repay someone for a kind deed, isn't it? This is some Dragon Ball Z level recap. He gave me the thing I wanted most of all, so I did the same thing for him. Bertho. No. Robert. Do looks upon the features that now only very faintly resemble the, those of the boy with whom he had once shared a birthplace and a friendship. No, please, call me Bertro. After all, at the end of this repetitive cycle, not even a shadow of his former self remains. He is, in his own opinion, twisted beyond all recognition. Robert, the prodigy child who was born in that laboratory they called an academy, is nowhere to be found. 
Because that's who I am. Robert, Mercho, Robert, Robert, true? <laughs> All that's left of him is his name. And even that is jumbled up. Like the staticky garbled laugh that blasts through Bircho's speakers. Uh, it's time to say goodbye. The army now. The me who was will simply end. Please take care of things in my stead. I hope you will do better than I did. Don't be ridiculous. I might be your reserve, but I am me. And as for you, over there in the shadows. Have you retrieved Yashiva's sacred artifact yet? Can you hurry up and show yourself ready? No way. How do you know I was there? I made sure to hide my presence and everything. Even my smell shouldn't be completely gone. I didn't. At least, not until he appeared. <laughs> to Elisa. But I figured you would be looking around. After all, that's your role, isn't it? To pop up where death is found. Hey, I decide my fate. No one rules me but me. If that is what you want to believe, then I suggest you follow me. And why the heck would I do that? Because I will tell you everything I know and give you the answers you seek. It's a very generous offer, and I recommend that you accept it. Mm. In exchange for my information, you'll perform various menial tasks for me. To start with, I want you to transport Bircho to my infirmary. Hmm? What's the point? He's dead, isn't he? Not quite, but he will be soon unless we get him to the life support system I created for this very purpose over the course of several loops. I am a genius, Break. You would do well to remember that. Now, do as I say. Sit, boy. You know, honestly, I'm not complaining about those recaps. Because going into every other chapter before, I couldn't remember those details. What? What's happening? Hey there. What do you think of my life support system? You were more banged up than I imagined you would be. But this should keep you going just a bit longer. How much though? I'm afraid I can't really say. In one corner of a laboratory hidden beneath a fake storefront somewhere in Bunkyo Ward, Bertro finds himself stuffed inside of and wired into some advanced contraption with a familiar old friend, and savior, it would seem, now addressing him. <laughs> Where exactly are we? My safe house. You may have seen a few scenes before inexplicably. There are virtually no others who know of this place. Do you mean to tell me you escaped from that battlefield carrying me over your shoulder? Me? Carry you? Of course not. You know we're not built for that kind of thing. I had your pal Break bring you here, of course, with that other wolf as well. Right, because they're both related to Odin, I believe. Uh, was it Odin or was it Sora? I can't remember it specifically. It might have been Odin, but there was some backstory between both Break as well as Bertrand's wolf being uh, related to uh, death or something like that. Right now, they're on a mission, so it's just the two of us here at the moment. I'd suggest you take this time to rest and recuperate as much as you can. It won't be an easy recovery, Bertro. So you really did escape with me. Such a possibility was never factored into my calculations. I never expected you to be so nearsighted. Tell me, where is your plan for surviving after making enemies of the whole city? This half-broken body may not catch anyone's eye. But the data stored within it, everyone's after that. So many memories I've made, loop after loop, looking out over this Tokyo from my seat in the Warmongers. Sooner or later, someone is going to come looking for it. This safe house don't stay safe for long. You know that, right? Huh. I wonder if in any previous loops the guild master of the three tree guilds have been captured uh, for that express purpose of sealing all their loot memories. 
It's the guiding principle of modern warfare. Information is power. Whoever controls the intel controls the battlefield. And memories amassed in previous loops are a veritable jackpot of intel. But something like that to consult, the enemy's movements can be predicted before they even happen. So far, the three tree guilds have maintained their delicate equilibrium solely because of the amount of information each one has, which is roughly the same as what the other two have. But when faced with the prospect of gaining so much knowledge from the countless loops Bertra has seen, no doubt every faction would start foaming at the mass just thinking about it. And it's a foregone conclusion that Bertro wouldn't just hand over such sensitive information. So if people were to come looking for it, they'd find it literally over his dead body. Not just his either. Duo, Bertro, and the others like them were created specifically to record memories of the game within this Tokyo, and carry them through each loop. That is a role, the only thing that gives their existence meaning. Lose that, and they are nothing. The geniuses are a bit of a mystery in terms of if they are made from the same laboratory, then why did they end up in three different competing guilds? And I did wonder what their purpose was. It seems to be hinting at that it's simply just a recording previous leaps, even though many other members of the guild can do that as well. Maybe unlike those other members, they are able to record the loops without any kind of a catch to it. Such as uh, the way Searcher is only able to uh, record member uh, record memories of uh, tragedy, and as his thought is only able to record memories of our death. Their role and rule is all that stands between them and their demise. Yes, yes, I know, and you're right. They will find it sooner or later. But I should be able to buy some time at least. But after all, there's a lot going on in this game that's just as crucial to deal with as we are, if not more so. Like the fallout from the Warmonger's ultimate weapon, Shiva, dropping out. He's the fourth world representative to exit the race after Azathoth, Surtur, and Tezcatlipoca. It's reasonable to assume that Curran is on her way to ascertain the present state of affairs as we speak. I expect she'll do a thorough investigation of the battlefield until she's satisfied she knows exactly what transpired. Given the present state of affairs, I can confirm that the retrieval of the secret artifact and residual memories of Divaloka's world representative, Shiva, has transpired here. Hard to believe four world representatives have already dropped out in this loop alone, though. Kern, the guild master of the rulemakers, one of the three true guilds, lets out a little sigh as she contemplates the gravity of the situation. I am wondering if people have dropped out of the race before, the world representatives that is. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if they have, but then again, the, with the way uh, Azathoth and Searcher left, uh, they seem to be permanent dropouts, or if another group this happened, they don't seem to be returning. So I wonder if that's also the case for Tuskali Poka and uh, now Shiva. The retirement of players from the game is not a cause for alarm in and of itself. Curran, like Bertro, isn't leading her guild with the intent to win, after all. Their aim is much more in line with that of the Game Masters, who work simply to ensure that the game endures. Huh. Well now we have an, some idea of what the Game Masters want, and we now have confirmation that they may be related to the Game Masters themselves, perhaps a product directly of them. They place their focus on observing the going-ons within each faction and recording those memories for posterity. So the fact that the Warmonger's overall military might has taken a huge hit from this loss really doesn't mean much to Kurin one way or another. 
The players that have dropped out are expendable and easily replaced. However, the rate at which these players are leaving the game could tip the precarious balance within Tokyo. The delicate equilibrium established among the three true guilds is heavily dependent on the number of world representatives each side has in its employ. It's thanks to this careful division of power that the game has been able to progress through so staggeringly many loops already. In the rare instance, when one of the three true guilds found itself coming out ahead, the other two have invariably worked together to push it back in line. If the warmongers grow any weaker, it could easily destabilize the equilibrium we've worked so hard to maintain. I've been monitoring my rule makers, and they are of course not a risk, but the invaders. They thrive on chaos and turmoil. Their players aren't very likely to pass up an opportunity for a fight. Especially since we prodigies who watch over them are likely to be on board with their schemes. This is all too much. If only I could confirm the situation inside. It might still be possible to take countermeasures. Kern then takes out her phone and attempts to contact the person the Game Master has hired to snoop on the invaders. Which would be Sanat Kumara, as we learned from Jiangxi. Pick up, please! Sadly, no matter how many times she places the call, there is simply no answer. I guess now the question is, did this mean you've been assassinated or assimilated? The possibility is certainly not out of the question that her spy has betrayed her, she muses. So this is a good confirmation that they are indeed part of the Game Master, it's not just associated. Because we already know for a fact that Sanat Kumara is part of, the game, part of the Game Masters, in communication with them, at least very short communication. And now we know that he is under the direct employ of Kurin. If I know anything about the Guild Masters of the Invaders and revolutionary prodigy behind a plan A, that is, evolution through assimilation with Isaac, There's another problem too. Plan D, Duo, has exhibited some uncharacteristically suspicious behavior. When the executor of Plan B, Bercho, reached the end of his operational life, Plan D was to inherit his spot as Guildmaster of the Warmongers. He was prepared as a reserve Guildmaster. That's Plan D itself. That should be the very reason he was allowed to live after his escape from the lab. But we've heard from unconfirmed sources that after he came in contact with Plan B, the two of them vanished to an undisclosed location. Your prodigies have a responsibility to determine the relative merits among our evolutionary threes that we each herald. So if I remember correctly, Isaac, of course, is a simulation, and Bertrose would be through... Uh, warfare? <laughs> through warfare, maybe? Can't remember exactly. And rulemakers... Um, completely escapes my memory, unfortunately. <laughs> this does lead to some professional rivalry with one another, so to speak. But that's as far as it goes, generally. So for following the logic behind this, it seems that the Game Masters are testing out theories of evolution. To what ends, this still has much of a mystery as the purpose of the game itself. If Plan D is to ignore our shared goal of keeping the game underway, however, I, as a Game Master, may be forced to take drastic action, up to and including Disposal. No, actually, there's something else that takes precedence over even that, a job only I can do. That being, retrieving the memory unit from the, the terminal is set to exclusively monitor the game's trophy, the one called Arathand. And just like Bertrand, this terminal is someone who's become unable to bear these countless loops any longer, and this requires a replacement. Until someone new can be found, Kern and the other two guild masters are to share the burden of safekeeping the divided memories. But Bertrand decided instead to give those memories to the trophy, of all people, for some utterly incomprehensible reason. 
but their mere existence and the implications thereof are known to almost no one, even among the Game Masters. Which puts the dealing with this matter quite firmly on my plate. I feel that this takes priority over the whole mess with the invaders and Plan D, so I shall deal with it accordingly. Let's go, Transcendental One, to the territory of the Summoners, where we will contact their guildmaster, the trophy of this game. Ooh, very direct. The massive robot picks up the girl named Kern, then flies off toward the south. We've never been so direct before. In the Warmongers, we were the one to initiate, and now it seems like it's time for the guilds to initiate. Bircho. I'll call you Bircho, since you insist that I do so. There is something I'd like to ask you. Why didn't you hold on to it? Excuse me? Oh yes, of course. I'm referring to the mechanical box you gave to the trophy. It's a vital tool on the road to omniscience and omnipotence. A key that could even bring this game to its conclusion. That's why it was split among the three of you, to help maintain equilibrium, no? Kern and the others had anticipated that I'd inherited it from you, along with the title of Guildmaster and the responsibility of monitoring the warmongers. Yet that isn't how things played out. Would you care to explain why not? Mm. You did mention something about it being your way of showing gratitude to the one who showed you what you needed to see. But there must be something else. Another reason you couldn't bring yourself to tell me. And I know what it is, naturally. You didn't want to burden me with all the responsibility, did you? You felt that leaving it with me would amount to a little more than making me follow in your footsteps. And you didn't want to see me meet the same end as you, right? You've always been like that, you know. Ever since our days in the lab. Duo. I... Honestly, there's really no need for you to concern yourself with any of that. I won't make the same mistakes as you've made. Rude. Though I suppose your rash actions are directly responsible for my being able to harbor you here and buy you time to heal. If my suppositions are correct, Kern should have chosen to prioritize intel control by now, and should be on her way to making contact with the summoners. So while she's busy with that, I should have time to deal with another issue. Another prodigy, to be more specific. Being Isaac. Do Don't tell me you're... If I know that revolutionary prodigy, I'm sure he could take a mess like this and somehow turn it on its head. Oh, <laughs> we're really using this map, huh? Even though it's about to be updated. About to. Don't quote me on that. The game in this Tokyo is about to undergo a fundamental change, both in its form and function alike. And the ones conducting this symphony are the members of that true guild that rules the southern third of Tokyo. The wild card of the three, its ranks filled with revolutionaries and radicals. Their name, simple and to the point, invaders. The true players of this game have always been representatives of the 23 worlds connected to Tokyo. But that aspect of flame may be on the verge of a massive change deed. Oh. Chapter 12, Invaders, Overture, the game of revolution. Thank you. <coughs> Shinjuku. After the vision, Beyond Revolution, Part 2. No battle. I've always, always believed that there is only one thing of value in this world. I've lived my whole life to this point believing in the absolute irreplaceable nature of that thing. I'm not alone in that. 
Everyone around me has acknowledged the inherent value of it. But one day, in the blink of an eye, it could easily crumble away like a tower of sand. That which has been built up over time will come crashing down, and there will be nothing left but a cloud of dust. One could find themselves left wondering what it is that they fancied so much in the first place. This is the fate that inevitably befalls all things of value. That value will crash, and all harbored feelings fade. Perhaps you'll grow bored of it, or perhaps a substitute takes its place. Value is derived from scarcity, after all. So if a suitable replacement can be found, value is instantly lost. It's like a revolution inherent in all things, predetermined to occur from the very beginning. Huh? Am I in a classroom? How? When did I get here? Mr. Mononobe? What? Have you come back? But why won't you say anything? Wait, I can't see your face anymore. Mr. Mononobe. Mr. Mononobe! Sando you? Oh, it was just a dream. Something about it seemed off though. And at the end, was that? Crap. Look at the time. If I don't hurry, I'm gonna be late. For school. <laughs> I guess they still have to do things as pedestrian as this if they want to uh, still count as being under the school. Good morning. Let's see you looking chipper today, Arthur. Morning, everyone. Feels like I haven't seen you in ages. Oh, I'm so, so sleepy, though. Uh, me too. I'm really worn down. I even thought of skipping first period. But that didn't happen. Only because I correctly assumed you'd be thinking that very thing and drag you here personally. Tango's exhaustion is not unreasonable, however. I sympathize with him quite deeply myself. Well, I suppose it's hard to argue with that. The battles we've been fighting lately are beyond anything we could have imagined. Yeah, I mean, the end of the world and the, the close end of the loop did just happen. I'm glad Life Wanderers is recapping. Very happy. <laughs> Thank you. I do not remember most of that, but now I do in, in the correct order, too. Tango in particular has been on the front lines for much of the fight. It is only natural he would feel fatigued from it. Well, actually, it probably has more to do with the fact that I stayed up late playing a new game and watching some videos. <laughs> you should have seen that video. It was a one turn clear of the Keiko dungeon. I sent you the links for everything too, partner. Did you get him? What do you think? The game was a lot of fun, but you know, I usually do the Shiro dungeon. You know, Kingo. This irresponsible behavior of yours has to stop. Have you even ever thought about life after graduation? Your attendance is lousy to begin with, and I'll bet you haven't even touched the future career survey they handed out. Oh, shut up already. Give me a break. I gotta unwind somehow, don't I? Uh, at any rate, does it not seem strange to anyone else that after our last fight, the warmongers have gone quiet? It is a bit odd, come to think of it. Perhaps they've called off their pursuit for now. Or maybe taken it below to the surface. Either way, neither Shuichi nor the Berserkers are seeing any real signs of activity from them at the moment. Up until just days ago, the Tree Shoe Guilds had been poised to clash with one another in seemingly apocalyptic fashion. Now, however, things seem to have somehow stabilized. 
We'll definitely need to keep an eye on what's happening, and not just in Ikebukuro, but throughout Tokyo. Everyone, from Ryota and Toji to a gracious collaborator arc, who now exists again, is doing their part to keep tabs on the situation. We all have to collaborate and come up with some way of dealing with the three true guilds that lie at the core of this game. The three true guilds, huh? Well, I've got something else on mind. Yeah, Shiro. It's all definitely important stuff, but you gotta think about Aerithan here. There's a whole other reason for him to stick his neck into this mess. From the very beginning, his fight's been a different story, you know? Hmm. I understand completely. Your top priority right now is to find Mr. Mononobe, I presume. After that fight, from what you've told me, he had quite a lot to tell you. In this Tokyo, there are three child prodigies who once monitored the Critical 23 as they monitored you. When the loops had worn me down to the merest shadow, these prodigies took my memories and split them into three pieces, one for each to keep. What remained of me should have been snuffed out then and there, but Mahakala protected me. In any case, the me who is talking to you right now is only a third of the man I once was. It's a miracle I'm even able to talk to you like this right now, and one I'm very grateful for. My memories are the most important thing that exists in this Tokyo. I don't mean that in a self-important way. I'm only talking about the memories. It's my original who was important, not me. I am merely the vessel who received a small portion of my original's memories. To put it simply, I am a copy designed to act on that person's behalf on this Tokyo. Hmm. An exception possessing omnipotence and omnipotence, the manifestation of all things in this world. An elusive being who looks upon this Tokyo from the distant heavens above. An exception called Solomon. Arathon. And that's what he told me. I want to get Mr. Mononobi back. I will get him back. Hmm. Shiro and company stand in silence, staring at the mechanical box in your hand. If the other two could be tracked down as well, it might be possible to restore Mr. Mononobe's memories, but... Is there a problem? What's the matter, everyone? As the guild strategist, I think there's something that much needs to be said here, Arthur. Painful as it is to suggest, I believe it prudent not to fully believe in everything Mr. Mononobi told you just yet. What? If you look at the current situation objectively, Mr. Mononobe is clearly in league with, if not of, the game's organizers. Yet he's kept that crucial information from us all this time, all so that he can monitor you, Arthur. As such, as trustworthy as he may seem, I feel it's highly risky to take his words at face value. We should consider the possibility that reassembling his memories may result in some adverse outcome for us. Yeah, that is that does make sense, honestly. Shiro. <laughs> I'm sorry for making you spell that out. No, on the contrary. I'm sorry for having to say it, truly. But I would be remiss in my duties if I did not. Shiro. Mm, come on now. Why are y'all gonna be making those sour faces? You just gotta take it with a grain of salt. I mean, anytime people start going on about being all knowing and all powerful, you can't just nod your head and accept it. Uh, 
I mean, think about it. If you're all-knowing and all-powerful, that means you know what's gonna happen in the future. So why would somebody who already knows how everything's gonna turn out put so much effort into this stupid game? That's level one atheism right there. Not to mention repeating it over and over and over again. It just doesn't make any sense. I can't believe I'm saying this, but Kengo actually makes a very good point here. If you know anything and everything that will ever come to pass, then what purpose could this game possibly serve? Yeah, exactly. Wouldn't you be bored with a game if you already knew every outcome of it? You'd put it down and play something else instead. And that's how it's always been for me. Look at Kengo getting smart and smarter by the chapter. I guess. You have cut short a lot of replays. For being as much of a dunce as you are, Kengo, you occasionally say some surprising nice things. I take offense to that. Zip it, book boy, or I'll zip it for you. Didn't you see I had so much character development in the past few minutes? Oh yeah? You don't want the army. <laughs> I guess what it comes down to in the end is, we just don't know enough about this game to really say anything for sure. All you know is that it's in our best interests to avoid being too predictable or too impulsive. Honestly, we don't even really know the significance, if there is any, of Mr. Mononobe's memories being split into three parts. If only there were some precedent we could refer to that might shed some light on. Uh -huh. Hmm? Is something the matter, Moritaka? Mm, my apologies. It's just that I thought I sensed my orb faintly shudder for a moment. Moritaka produces the orb bearing the mark of filial piety and studies it carefully for a moment before continuing. There seems to be no sign of any reaction or resonance. Perhaps it was just my imagination. Please don't excuse me. Oh, okay. If you're sure. To continue what I was saying, then. The real fact of the matter is, we have just as much reason to believe Mr. Manlobi as to doubt him. That is to say, none. We simply don't have enough to go either way, so I see no reason we shouldn't just proceed as we see fit right now. Thank you, Shiro. You're not the only one who cares about Mr. Mononobe, remember? He was a teacher, counselor, and confidant to us all. There is still a lot of uncertainty surrounding this, and I really think it's best to avoid being too predictably brash. But that being said, it's not like I don't want to rescue him. On the contrary, I really want to see him again. That's the spirit. Let's get him back. Please don't use past tense, though. He's still our teacher and confidant. Uh, what's with the weird look? Well, it sounded like you just said... Good morning, and my most humble apologies for keeping you waiting. To your seats now. Homeroom is about to begin. Ah, good morning, Mr. Sadayu. <laughs> Who's this? Why do you seem so bewildered, Arthur? This is none other than our new homeroom teacher, Mr. Sadayu Momochi. I know well that within the flowing river of time, change is a constant from which nothing can escape. Even the most successful, most all-encompassing dynasty will inevitably run its course, and another will take its place. And when such a paradigm shift should occur, the word most befitting it is revolution. Firmly gripping in the man's hand is a bagua board, said to indicate the mandate of heaven itself along with some paper talismans. A glamorous revolution to provide some small comfort for the world it befalls, such is the original language and intent. You're kidding! Completely wiped out? That can't be right! We've ensured an established business plan to be completely infallible! Hey, look at Gimo, existing in main quest. 
Billy. The very foundations of the Roppongi Guild and all its business moguls are shocked beyond belief. The numbers of the Monitor indeed tell a sobering tale, an absolutely heartrending deprecation of the Roppongi Guild's assets. Uh oh. On account of the fact that a certain research lab has just made public their newest development, rendering instantly obsolete all technology Gumao and company had invested in. Alongside a new legal code that also has suddenly taken effect, more or less flipping every last bit of market analysis on its head. Basically, anything and everything that could have happened to make these investments go south did, without the slightest forewarning, and the timing is too perfect to be mere coincidence. It's as if Gimo were gambling, only to find his winning chip stack suddenly and unilaterally declared abandoned and returned to the house. I am completely confident, without a shadow of a doubt, that someone has launched a financial assault against us. But how? How could they create a storm of this magnitude with such expert efficiency? No one can truly know the future of this world. Not a soul. Save for us. The Bagua, the yin and yang, elicits the division of heaven and earth. It is a representative of foundation of nature and life. It is a formation that encompasses the eight directions, and thus encompasses everything in creation. Nothing is free of its domain. His actions are streamed live. His viewers unanimously applaud and cheer him on in the comments. They applaud as the riches of the Roppongi elite mysteriously crack and crumble in an instant. Indeed, this event is akin to the implosion of a building, the eruption of a volcano, or the start of the apocalypse. This man's viewers act as if caught up in a moment of great energy. And surely, this incredible takedown would not go unnoticed. It is, after all, the ultimate money game, or perhaps the ultimate show all around. Hmm. But the mysterious man's eyes aren't focused on the destruction he just wrought, nor on the comments of his enthusiastic chat. No, they stare into the distance as he mounts these words. Sorry to have kept you waiting, my pretty. Let's begin a revolution here and now. After Division Beyond Revolution Part 3, no battle. Mr. Sandy, he was the best. When I first heard we were getting a new homeroom teacher, I was worried, but it turned out great. Mr. Sandy is so kind and gives such great advice. I don't know what we ever d did without him. We've had a lot of teachers transferring here lately, but I'm just glad it was him who got picked to lead our class. Our former homeroom teacher? You mean, Mr. Mononobe? Come to think of it, I wonder what he's up to now. I hadn't really thought about it, since we have a lot of teachers. No sense devoting too much gray matter to stuff like that. Hey, not cool. Did you forget how much Mr. Mononobe cared for us? Hey, what's it to you? Somebody irresponsible enough to just piece out of his own class is hardly worthy of leading anything. Yo, hey, oh, that's rude. I'm sure you just had some extenuating circumstances and took a leave of absence or something. And then he should have said something to us about it. We're his students after all. He's the rude one here. Hmm? You teacher my foot. Hume is a member of this faculty. I don't care if he's not on record anymore. It's bad enough his record's been wiped. If having a replacement is enough for people to forget him, I'm... I'm gonna... If no one else cares enough to chase after him, I'll do it by myself. Yes, I do sympathize with that sentiment entirely. The problem is that, despite our best efforts, we still don't have the slightest lead on Rizzer whereabouts. However, no matter how we feel, we mustn't become absorbed in our search for clues and allow the students' education to suffer because of it. Uh, Alright. 
Yeah, you got me on that one. But doesn't this whole situation just piss you right off? Of course it does. To even suggest otherwise is an insult, Mr. Jean. But we must. Oh, this has been awkward. <laughs> Spilling tea. No, no. You dastardly do. Please try not to argue like that. It's unbecoming of teachers to fight on school grounds. Uh, how? When did you? Damn it. Don't get all buddy buddy with me. Get your hands off me right this instant. If you know what's good for you. Mr. Jean, Mr. Treaton. I want you to know, I have the, only the utmost respect and esteem for you both. And I'm certain you've both done a bang-up job filling in during the previous teacher's absence thus far. Uh, his name was Kiyomo Mononobe, I believe. For the two of you to speak so passionately of him, he must surely have been an exceptional man. And, of course, I would never deign to declare myself a worthy replacement for someone so admired. My only goal here is to help out however I can. I hope you will see me as a suitable substitute, a reliable runner-up. So, let us work together for the students of this fine academy, and trust me with their education. I shall not fail you! Uh... Hey, Mr. Treaton. Maybe this guy's not all that bad, eh? <laughs> Mr. Jean, you idiot! Don't let yourself get taken in that easily. <laughs> Never seen that face from Mr. Jean before. Hello? Ellie, what's your status? What do you mean you're flying solo? Have I not scolded you enough for your lack of cooperation? You really are just that obtuse, aren't you? Um, if I remember correctly... Ellie was going to find uh, the rest of the eight orbs of uh, the Hakenchi, and maybe Tanato agreed to help her. It's interesting because they had no former relationship uh, be before this, uh, before that scene, but they seem to be in contact with each other and perhaps even friends, at least during the events of Battle of the Valentines. How do I get it through your head that the one you seek is beyond your capacity to take on without some help? Hello? Hello? Hey! Ellie, can you hear me? Do you copy? Answer me, Ellie! <laughs> Chris, did she just hang up on me? Well, well. You seem to be entertaining yourself quite nicely, Counselor Tontomo. Humblest the apologies, my lord. Did my voice travel? I beg your pardon for the impropriety. Please, I couldn't care less for such formalities. As long as you're having fun, I see no cause for concern. I can't exactly say I was having fun, my lord. Oh? If I may be so bold, is it really okay to remain on standby right now? If you gave the order, I'd be happy to investigate. I told you, there's no good that come of that. If things take a turn, all we'd stand to gain is civil unrest. Hmm. There are people in this Tokyo who specialize in infiltrating organizations and sowing discontent without leaving a trace. And though we may be strong, we are no monolith. Internal strife within the warmongers is a fate I shudder even to consider. Alright, seems he's guarding himself inv against invaders. Which... Given how long this is going to be in two chapters, this chapter as well as chapter 13, probably not very successful. Therefore, we watch and we wait. You should know this, but you seem unconvinced. What's the matter, Counselor? Nothing, my lord. Nothing at all. Your reasoning is sound as ever. Of course, if General Balor were here, we wouldn't need to be so reserved. In the face of one who indiscriminately slaughters friend and foe alike, division within the ranks loses all meaning. Whether a soldier should fight proudly or defect, once that eye opens, there's nothing left of them but ash. 
So Ballora was their means of enforcement, I suppose? Of course. These are all just f flights of fancy at this point. In practical terms, General Ballora has already bid adieu. I'm well aware that I cannot always count on having the Invincible General at my side. It is a bitter pill, but I've taken it. Idealism doesn't win battles, after all. We must look to the future and conceive the next best course of action. Come, Counselor Tanatomo. There is a meeting to attend. Please, follow me. Yes, my lord. I'm right behind you. One day, after school in Shinjuku Academy, even called to meet with the new homeroom teacher for a routine guidance counseling evaluation. You check the school's clock, however, and find that there's still a bit of time before your appointment. Hmm, don't want to be too early, so I might just chill here for a bit. Ta-da! Your adorable familiar, Lil Son, at your service! So, that's not the time for snappy introductions. What the heck is up with that poser, anyway? Ugh. I'm talking about the new teacher of yours. Sandy, you, was it? Total poser. Why does that father have to be treated like a demon just because that POS poser is here now, anyways? <laughs> Shall I say? You feel me, master, don't you? You understand where I'm coming from, right? 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 Uh. Uh, 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 he doesn't seem like a bad person. <laughs> how, how can he say that? How can he take a side? You know what he represents, right? If we accept him as a new teacher, then father won't have any place to come back to. Hmm. Speak of the devil. And, uh, sorry to keep you waiting. This is the first we've spoken face to face like this, isn't it, Arthur? Allow me to, to formally introduce myself. My name is Sandyu Momoji. <laughs> but you can call me San. But you can call me Mr. Sandyu. <laughs> Thank you for taking the time to see me. All right then. You're here for guidance canceling evaluation, I believe. But there's a problem with that. You only just met me, and I don't know a soul who'd be comfortable spilling their heart out of a total stranger. Uh, that's a good point. <laughs> Glad you agree. I appreciate youngs who are honest with themselves and honest with us teachers too. For starters, I think it's important to make sure you understand that I'm not your an enemy. To that end, let's say we get to know each other a bit before the main event, hmm? As for me, I've actually done this at a number of different academies before coming here to Shinjuku. I filled the boots of teachers who left their post for one reason or another many times before, much like I'm doing now. It's pretty much what I do. I serve as an emergency replacement. Or a substitute, rather, in situations like these. That's why I've been looking to my predecessor's way of doing things. It makes the job go a lot more smoothly. My predecessor, Mr. Mononobe. If I understand correctly, he was your legal guardian here, no? And not just for school matters. Ever since he transferred here, He's had your back on a lot of things, hasn't he? Yeah, he has. Mr. Mononobe has been a rock for me. But why are you asking about that? No particular reason. Just marveling at what all that man was able to accomplish, all while taking on full teaching duties. Now, I've sat down with the journal he left, you see, and done my best to glance over his many, many entries. I was surprised by how meticulously detailed they are. He really was an extraordinarily dedicated educator.
Mr. Mononobe wrote about all of his students, naturally. But you definitely got the lion's share of the entries. One might be inclined to think that you're a little hellraiser with the amount of ink that man devoted to you. And it wasn't all about the things he did on school grants. No, it seems he run with students from a number of academies. Mr. Mononobe definitely had his hands full with you, I'd say. What do you agree, Arison? I absolutely do not agree. Probably. <laughs> it's fine, it's fine. The best students are overflowing with passion and zeal. Just like that. So, are we done here? <laughs> what? Do you want me to be angry? Who want me to threaten you with some kind of punishment? Well, tough luck. Because I'm not putting any blame on you for anything. If you got something to take care of, just do it! I recognize the fact that I'm only here to fill Mr. Monrobe's boots. I'm not going to change his policies willy-nilly. Of course, I can't do everything the same way he did, since I'm not him. But I'll do my best to live up to his legacy. Hmm? What's the matter, Arthur? Well, you've got the right spirit, but your impression of Mr. Mononobe is a little bit off. Hmm. A magical game where you fight with strange powers, after which everything goes back to normal when you close the app. Those on the outside don't even know what went on. When it's all over, there are no traces of any damage having been done to anyone. You are free to enjoy as much violence as you like, and yet none of the consequences spill over into the real world. Wonders rise in rank, friend circles grow. Of course, everyone would get hooked on such a game. Though it might label me unfit as a teacher, I'm not going to scold you. You tried to save me, right? In fact, you did. I may have been killed by those thugs if it weren't for you. I'd like to express my gratitude. Thank you, Arizon. When did this happen? You must be quite strong among app users. So strong that you made those thugs fear for their lives. There is something I must impart to you as a teacher. No. As a person. You may wield immense power within that app. You may even experience moments that allow you to behave like you are better than others. But don't get addicted to that narrow comfort zone. Aff or not, I've seen many students get carried away like that. The notion of excelling at something can easily lead to thinking that you must act in a certain way. Mr. Mononobe was the truth bullets as usual. It may make you think that small world encompasses the whole of your identity. It may even make you think the only place you can live your life is inside of that small world. As if remembering something, Mr. Mononobe looks down, breaking away from your locked gaze. You might get fixated on that idea and lose yourself, winding up trapped in that small world. Eventually, you might never be able to leave that place. Mm. It was so long ago. I can't picture his face anymore. I'm even forgetting his voice, but... Even though he didn't exactly stop me, Mr. Mononobe did get mad sometimes. He never figured out what he was mad about, though. He could have been mad at someone else, but you're pretty sure he wasn't. His anger seemed to stem from memories bubbling to the surface of his mind. Maybe he was mad at himself? Or maybe he was reminiscing about how you used to be, and was scared because he saw you making the same mistakes he once did. If I were to be granted one final wish, I would ask to see you and your classmates graduate. Nothing would bring me more joy than to see you escape the clutches of this unending cycle, and head out into the world to make your mark on it. Mm. 
Mm. He told you what he wanted most back then, his fondest wish. Let's talk about my future, Mr. Sandyu. About what to do with my life. And I want to know what you're thinking. Interesting indeed. I hadn't imagined my predecessor would have taught you about those sorts of things. If that's what you'd like to discuss, though, then let's discuss it. I am, as I said before, not your enemy, after all. <sighs> yeah! <laughs> this is harder than I expected. I suppose that's the nature of those constantly fighting some enemy. Without an enemy in sight, they're left phased and at a loss. Eventually, they'll actively seek out an enemy, breaking friendships apart and starting needless conflict. People who can't do anything without a foe to vanquish are so easy to manipulate. It is so distressing and nerve-wracking not to know who is or isn't an enemy. Speak of the devil. It looks like we acquired a few moles with that new batch of teachers I was a part of. I'm quite certain I've seen a number of their faces before in Kabukicho, doing who knows what for who knows who. Shinjuku Academy here is quite the hotbed for spies and Asians from each and every faction. Even if they belong to the same guild, they would easily cross blades if they were hired by different employers. Anyway, this really isn't the time to be preaching about internal conflicts. Let's get the show on the road. Yeah! <laughs> Hmm, not much luck today either, it seems. It's been a few days now since the stranger set foot in Kabukicho and sparked a massive battle between the West and South True Guilds. The Kabukicho Guildmaster, Ellie, has been on the hunt for a certain transient since then. Masanoi Daikaku Inumura. I was expecting him to be much easier to track down than this, especially for me. Especially for her, because she's Ellie, the vampire queen of Kabukicho. No shadow is a dark enough cover to hide those she seeks. And yet... Ugh, this is ridiculous. Something isn't right. How is it I can't find a single trace of him anywhere? Not even a hint of presence or the faintest vestige was left for her to find. Why am I putting so much effort into this again? This is so not me. I don't do a lot of field work, and I don't use my head. Ellie's assessment is surprisingly on point. This is the very first time she's ever worked so earnestly, putting herself under other guilds' radars. Skirmishes over portals are only permitted during the day, when she's busy with school. As a nocturnal, Ellie is most active when other guilds have turned in for the night. More importantly, Ellie has never really shown any interest in fighting over portals in the first place. Still. This most recent event gave Ellie a particular reason to get involved personally. One day, a stray dog wanders into Kabukicho. Ellie stumbles upon this dog and casually asks, What brings you to Tokyo? The dog replies that he had died once, but has returned to take care of unfinished business. Specifically, eight pieces of unfinished business. Eight transients who each bear an orb. Although not related by blood, they are his children nonetheless. They are connected in some nebulous way to the noble woman he loves, and he worries for their well-being. Ellie suspects the dog is hiding further secrets, but she can't bring herself to pry. And then... Without warning, 
He simply vanishes to somewhere out of reach. This town has a certain code followed by those who live here. We accept and take in all who have nowhere else to go, and always look out for one another. But Ellie wasn't able to look out for that particular stray. And the string of that failure to uphold the oath of the outlaws is a blemish on her pride as the queen of Kabukicho. So if she can't fight the dog to take him in, she'll do the next best thing and try to gather the fragments of his regrets, fulfilling his mission. I am the queen after all. We have to see this through. But... Uh, it can wait until tomorrow night, I think. I'm awfully tired right now. I think I'll make my way into the back of Tsukuyomi's place and turn in for the day. Ah, oh, crap. It's an incoming call from Suzuka. And I've missed so many already. Ellie notices the many missed calls from Suzuka on her screen and lets out a high-pitched whine of despair. This is something she would really prefer not to deal with. Uh, I'll bet she's really pissed at me for skipping school, like, a lot this past while. Suzuka is not only a high-ranking member of the Outlaws Guild that Ellie leads, but also her classmate at night school. Maybe I should just ignore it, but if I do that, she won't shut up about it the next time I see her. Ugh. Hello? Suzuka? Ellie! Hello! Thank goodness I finally got through. What's wrong? You sound pretty stressed out. Is it about Tsukiyomi? Who's gone? I'll explain later. Listen, are you in Kabukicho? You need to get out of there, stat! I'm out of options here, and... Damn it! Just don't do anything brash, do you understand? Huh? What happened? Suzuka? Hello? Hello? Ali stops to consider what might be happening. Could some enemy have infiltrated Kabukicho? No, that can't be it. Suzuka will fight with Unmatched Frosty to protect the people of Kabukicho. That's just how she is. She's the kind of person who would rather fight and endure pain herself than order her companions into battle and see them injured. More importantly, Suzuka is all too familiar with the sheer strength of the Queen of Kabukicho at night. She wouldn't tell me to stand back on this. Hmm? Hey, aren't those students from our school? They look a little... angry. The school uniforms are a dead giveaway. These are definitely students from Kabukicho Academy, where the ogres dwell. A great majority of those who attend that academy are members of the outlaws, so chances are, these are Ellie and Suzuka's comrades. There! It's Ellie! A sworn enemy! Surround her! Don't let her get away! Huh? Yeah, she'll be fine. Alright then, after Kapikicho Academy, your next target will be Shinjuku Academy, right here. Signed are you, Muses, on how all the things he told you were technically true. There wasn't a single lie in the whole speech. I'm really not your enemy, and I will certainly do my part to look out for you, Erithin. But that doesn't mean you aren't liable to become your own undoing. Sure hope that doesn't happen, though, hmm? What would you do if you found yourself in a nerve-ending battle, where no hide nor hair of the enemy could be seen? What then? That's when people find enemies within themselves, and the civil unrest begins. All we have to do is sow the seeds of conflict and plant a few ideas. Then let the locals start all the fires. Through all of this, the real enemy will never be revealed. Doubt will take over their minds and flip the world upside down. So this is a strategy that the invaders first employed in the dungeon memories for Fisher King. Be sure to check out the dungeon memories. At least it seems that in this case, they seem to be hinting at uh, the relation here of the invaders' general strategy of spreading confusion. Things certainly aren't going to turn out as they always have. Now will they, Erthen? Hmm. 
From this point on, the face of the game changes, and a new phase begins. A more modern take on warfare, where the enemy stays in the shadows, and the sham fighting between terrorists and revolutionaries can progress unabated.